Help me in welcoming to the stage three-time Grammy-nominated composer and saxophone player, the band leader for David Bowie's Black Star Band, the one and only Donnie McCaskey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us, Good man. Please have a seat. Thank you. How you feeling today? I'm good. I'm good, thanks. Be beautiful trip from Brooklyn out to... Beautiful trip from Brooklyn. I've been home for um, a couple weeks now, kind of decompressing from a lot of touring. <laughs> so taking the kids to school a lot, making dinner, <laughs> you know. That doesn't sound like decompressing to me. That actually well, sounds it's like true. It's more not, recompression. Yeah, it's not total decompression, but the, the love of being with the children is carrying me through the angst that happens <laughs> when you try to feed your children and get them to school on time. Who is more unruly? Uh, the other members of the band when you're on the road or your kids when you're at home? Definitely my kids when I'm at home. <laughs> yeah, because when I first come home, when I, you know, they're really happy to see me. And then, and then there's like the second day, which is payback for when I've been <laughs> gone. And usually that's when my wife is gone and I'm, you know, kind of running the show and there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Welcome back. Here's the keys. Here's the kids. Yeah, which I and then and then the kids are giving me a hard time because I've been gone, you know. But nice. it's, it's good. So I want I want to go back. Uh, your music career started at a very young age. You were gigging on large stages at the age of twelve with your dad. Yeah, yeah. I started um, when I was twelve. I was actually in a photography class in junior high school, and I was not really engaging with the class. And and you know, I found out that it was the last day that you could switch classes and my best friend from um, elementary school was in beginning orchestra. So I, I just switched without having played an instrument. And my father is a piano player and a vibraphone player and he had offered various times over the years, you know, do you want to take some lessons? you want to take piano lessons, clarinet? I always said no. I was more into sports, basketball and whatnot. But um, I got into the class, my dad asked me what I wanted to play and I said saxophone. And it was an impulsive decision, but um, looking back on it, I think it was because the guy who played in my father's band when I was growing up was a very sort of charismatic player. He was a hippie, hmm. you know, like a tie-dye t-shirt, and he would play these like wild solos, um, sort of avant-garde, and it was just really, um, I don't know, it was, it was interesting. Growing up in Santa Cruz, um, it was an interesting cultural kind of environment to grow up in, and, and Anyway, he was, very, he was very charismatic. I remember one time looking into the bell of his saxophone, and it was like a pool of condensation with a cigarette butt floating in the middle <laughs> of it, which is kind of <laughs> gross now. But as a 12-year-old, I was like, man, that's really cool. You know, <laughs> the most so, jazz thing. Yeah, ever. anyway, so that was it. You know, it, was, it, was, it was saxophone right away. And then, um, and, and then it was something that I just started doing. I started practicing a lot right away, and, and, uh, and things went from there. Yeah, well, and it seemed to progress quite quickly. I mean, through even high school, you were already performing on things like the Montreal Jazz Festival. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was fortunate. Um, you know, Santa Cruz is, is, is a relatively small town, but there was a, a high school uh, in the next town over where my father lived, my parents were divorced. So I was able to use my father's address to get access to this high school that had an incredible uh, band director. His name was Don Keller, a trumpet player who had been um, best friends with Bill Berry in the Navy, who was also a trumpet player, who had played in Duke Ellington's band. So um, Bill had given Don a copy of all these different Ellington charts. And this was at a time when none of this stuff was readily available for high school or college bands. So I was in the small town, but playing Duke Ellington's music four or five days a week, which was amazing. Then. Uh, the Coomba Jazz Center had opened um, before that. It opened up in 1976, but the thing was, um, bands would play in San Francisco from Tuesday through Sunday night, and then they would come to Santa Cruz on Monday night and play the Coomba Jazz Center, the small nonprofit. But because of that, I was able to hear Elvin Jones. That was the first concert I went to when I was 12. <laughs> Followed by McCoy Tyner, you know, two weeks later, Art Blakey, uh, Cedar Walton, Phil Woods, and kind of the list goes on and on. So I had access once a week to these, you know, legends of the music. And, and then Santa Cruz was just very vibrant. Uh, there was a lot of music. I was um, in a salsa band. There was a large Hispanic population, mm -hmm. you know, in the area. So I was, I was in a salsa band. Um, 
all the major reggae groups played in Santa Cruz. Um, so I saw Jimmy Cliff, Peter Tosh, Mighty Diamonds, Black Uhuru, Burning right. Spear. Um, uh, what else? And Paul Jackson, uh, who was who played bass in Herbie Hancock's group, The Headhunters. Okay. He was living in Santa Cruz at that time. And so I was like 15 or 16, and I was in his band. And he was playing <laughs> bass and Casio and singing. It was really out. And the band was called Surely Out, actually. <laughs> but I was in that. And, and so just being able to play all the time. Right. And then my, having this sort of green light with my father to just come and play with his band. He played four or five days a week. And I could just go after school or on the weekends. I could stay there all day and play. So just the, the sum total of all that experience. It makes me think of Malcolm Gladwell mm -hmm. and his book Outliers. I don't know if you guys have read that. But there's something in there where he talks about the 10,000 hour right. thing. And, and I, I think that was you know, the beginning of that accumulation of time. Um, playing music, having to deal with different music situ musical situations, being on the instrument hour after hour after hour. And in a way, you know, my first sort of, you know, after Santa Cruz, I went to college at Berkeley College of Music and I maybe was a junior or maybe a junior, and I got invited by Gary Burton. Right, I was going to mention that you okay. did the road with Gary Burton. So this is all. Uh, so this is sort of prior to joining his group. I was in a student group that he led that did a jazz cruise, you know. And I went to the rehearsals, and you know, I was nervous. I was just like, you know, Gary Burton and all the guys who were playing in the band were all great, and you know. So I, I remember feeling like I probably didn't do so well in the rehearsals. But then the first gig, you know. I, I, I played up to my ability at the time, and I remember him sort of, you know, uh, reacting to it. And, and, and sometime later, he said that, yeah, it was like it was a whole other situation with me when I was on the bandstand. And, and I realized, well, that was because I was so comfortable having had right. all this experience with yeah. all these different yeah, the pedigree and background that you've listed out there, it seems like it'd be pretty difficult to hit you with a, a new person that's going to put you on edge or, or stun you at all, having grown yeah. up through that list of names. It's pretty astounding. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was great. It was great. So you, you did four years floating around uh, with Gary's band, and yeah. then that ended up leading you here yes. to New York City. Yeah. And was it, I, I want to know, I don't know exactly the order, but at some point it, you either moved to New York City and then replaced Michael Brecker in Steps Ahead? Yeah, basically I, was, I had moved to New York City and the first year or so I was still playing a bit with Gary. That ended and I was just freelancing and I think I did a gig with Eddie Gomez. Okay. Who was one of the original guy, the original bass player in Steps. And um, some sequence of events led to me getting a call from Mike Maneri to join Steps. And this is like the early 90s. Right. And um, there had actually been a couple sax players after Michael before I joined. But, um, you know, it was a big a big deal for me to get that opportunity because I was such a fan of that band right. and such a fan of his playing. And like these solos he played on some of these songs that I was now going to perform, they're like iconic solos I've listened to, you know, hundreds of times. So the thing was, ultimately, it was a really, really great opportunity because I had to find my own way to play these songs, right. my own way of improvising on these songs that didn't sound like I was trying to... Um, you know, sort of copy what he did, which nobody could do anyway. <laughs> but, but like, really, you know, my generation of, of saxophone players were so influenced by him. So this was, uh, it was a great opportunity because it forced me to just, like, okay, what's, what, how am I going to do this? How am I going to find, what, what is my voice? And how can I kind of develop that in this context where I'm so influenced by, this, by the original source right, material? Right, right. Uh, in... In that same time period, though, it wasn't like you were only doing steps work. Yes. You have, again, this sort of, I, I want to say incestuous. That's a very good term for what I think the music world in New York City is, and specifically with jazz. And it sounds like it's, it holds true for the West Coast as well. But this, this idea that kind of everyone kind of knows everybody and the, the, the swapping and sharing of players was is very is and was very prominent at the time. You did a lot of uh, additional work, uh, folks like Gil Evans and, and Dave Binney and Scott Coley mm -hmm. uh, that you did a whole collaboration with. Yeah. Do you find that collaboration is just like a natural state for you, or is it? How do you approach that when you when you are pairing up with these other big players to collaborate on something? Well, I think 
I remember at one point, um, you know, being here and kind of, you know, doing my thing of floating around from club to club during, you know, the night and hearing different things. And at one point seeing David Lieben, who's a you know, very famous saxophone player and educator and very influential, you know, voice in the music. And, we, you know, we were just talking and, and he said to me like, so, you got your boys? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean, Mr. Lieben? You know, <laughs> what do you, what, what do you, but I knew what he meant, you know, and, and like, did I have a group of people I was meeting with regularly. And I didn't at that point. This is, I can't remember when it was, probably just when I moved to New York. But it, it, it got me thinking about how important that would be. Mm-hmm. And you know, in a way, I was just kind of floating around. And then through a sequence of, of events, you know, I just sort of fell into this um, group of guys with David Binney, Scott Colley, um, Jeff Hirschfield on drums, some other guys. and. That, that was kind of it, because I remember, I think it was, I started playing sessions with Dave, and um, we seemed to just be musically compatible, and then socially compatible. We're both from California, both into sports, you know, just got along really well, and that le- eventually played on one of his records, and that was kind of how this group came together, and then, and then we were all young, all just in New York, so we had time, mm. you know, so we would get together, like, two, three, four times a week and workshop material, like being in a band. I guess it was a co-op in this situation because we were all bringing our own original music. But that was, you know, um, it was was really um, a great opportunity because I started to hear their individual voices. And then I started to think about writing for that in that aesthetic or that kind of group. Um, because I, sometimes when you're writing music, it's a little, it's daunting just to sit at the keyboard and be like, I'm gonna write a song today. Hmm. What am I gonna write? You know, and it's just this sort of huge playing field, you know, but, but when it, you can narrow it down like, oh, okay, no, I'm writing for this group. Right. And more, more so than that, I hear the way he plays bass. I hear his saxophone sound. And, so, and, and then it, it, it helps me to focus a lot. And I feel like sometimes, um, the most successful projects or recordings that I've, I've um, facilitated are ones where I felt that strong sense of direction and sound uh, with the personalities involved. So that was, that was, a, that was a really great thing. And, and, that, was, and that happened. That group, uh, eventually, we started calling it Lan Zhang. And we did a lot of touring and just, again, hours and hours on the bandstand, hours hanging, listening to music, talking about live, talking about music, all that stuff really, um, I grew a lot through that experience. Yeah. Kind of staying on the topic of, of New York City and the jazz scene in New York City, you know, jazz has been a little bit protected through time in the sense of, as the mainstream sort of shifts its focus, you know, it, disco just was destroyed by the change of the times, but jazz has always been this presence, especially in, in cities like New York, yes. where it seems like there's a, just a strong, tight-knit community. You do uh, a lot of touring, like you mentioned, but you mm. also play a lot here in the city. Mm. Do you feel that, that that's true of this? Is, is, the, is the jazz community tight-knit? What keeping, is, is that what's keeping it alive? Is that what's keeping it going in places like this? Well, New York City is really, the epicenter, I think, for jazz music. It's not the only center, but it is really, um, is really the epicenter to me. And um, part of what keeps it going is there's so much, um, there are so many great musicians here. You know, sort of every instrument, kind of every ilk. You know, there's just such a high concentration here, and and you know, people getting together. You know, working on. Um, projects and you know learning from each other there's just a lot of creative energy around that and it and I think also with the intensity of New York City and Mm. the pace and just the struggles for survival here that adds another element of of, um, intensity to the music that I think is important I mean certainly for me coming from Northern California growing up in that environment and now living here there's a big difference culturally you know and I remember feeling you know, in California, like, you know, the intensity that I, I bring to music or that comes out when I'm playing music isn't really, doesn't really fit here as well as I think it'll fit in New York. And that's been true. 
nothing against California, but like, you know, you come here and there's, I think there's part of that mm -hmm. struggle that all plays into it. And then you have the history here, you know, of, of how much the music has developed here over the years. And then you have um, the fact that there are people who come to New York City to hear jazz music. There's like a jazz tourism thing, you know, clubs like the Blue Note, the Village right. Vanguard, they benefit from that. So um, I guess all those things, you know, go into um, making this the place it is for jazz music. And in terms of its survival, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, big, it's a big thing to answer. You know, part of it is that um, the music is so much about self-expression. Right. And, and I think that's something that hopefully will never go away. I mean, other obviously other realms of music are as well, but jazz, improvisation, the individuality, telling your story in the moment from song to song. I mean, there's something very unique about that in the music world. And I think that will never die because I think that's connected to, you know, man's men and women's humanities need for self-expression. Sure. And there, obviously there's a lot of different ways that happens, but for musicians, I think that's something that, that'll never go away. Um, what else would I say about it? Um, have, have you ever struggled with it? You mentioned the pace and the intensity of the city. Have you ever struggled to separate from that? Like uh, you find yourself writing sort of more up-tempo, intense songs? Is it hard to break away and like write a ballad and calm it down for a minute? Well, I would say that, um, yes, sometimes, you know, not, I, I mean, in the end, I think I'm most successful when I, I just let the song be what it's gonna be. And that's the problem, is that sometimes, you know, I've been living in Brooklyn for like 23 years, and I remember at certain points writing a song, and, and it was, I remember this, it was a ballad, and it was pretty. And I was thinking, ah, oh, shouldn't this be darker? Shouldn't, shouldn't there be more <laughs> angst? It's not convincing there's, me. There's too, you know, there's not enough, uh, there's not enough wide intervals. You know, it's too, it's too, and, 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 you know, I was sort of over criticizing the work instead of just letting it be what it was going to be. And eventually I was like, no, man, this is a song. I just have to let it come out this way and, and not judge it, you know? So um, for me, it's actually just been trying to let the music be what it's going to be and, and everything else takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, all this time in New York, and this leads to a few years ago where you were contacted uh, via a mutual friend by David Bowie and asked to play on the song Sue, right? And this then kicked off the whole Black Star saga that's, that's transpired. Can you speak to the experience of yeah. meeting David Bowie? And uh, absolutely. I mean, it was, um, so Maria Schneider is this composer that I've worked right. with for like, I don't know, 14 years or something. and. Um, she was getting together with David to work on Sue. It was like a collaboration, like him singing with her band, which I'm in. And so she was calling me um, during that time, and you know, I was just giving her feedback on stuff. Um, but at a certain point, she said, "Yeah, you know, I think you should do something with you." And 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 she played him one of my records. Uh, it was called Casting for Gravity, and and suggested it to him. And then I think you know, suggested it to him again and again, you know, and she was just telling me about this and I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, you never know what's gonna happen with those kind of things, but eventually they came to hear us play at the 55 bar and later she told me that he had said, oh, I see that, you know, Donnie's playing here, let's go, so they came down together. I didn't meet him, I knew that he was coming. I actually didn't even tell everybody in the band. I told Mark, Juliana, uh, who plays drums, but I didn't tell the other guys. Um, and then I saw them, and then that was it. They were gone. But a week later, I had um, the first like workshop session with, with Maria and uh, a few people from her band, David and Tony Visconti, mm -hmm. David's longtime producer. So that's where I met him for the first time. And so at that point, you know, I knew that he was interested in doing something. But again, I didn't want to... Um, think about it. <laughs> you know, I just was uh, like, you know, just here to, to work on this piece. And then, you know, I, I remember uh, I, I arrived early, you know, to the rehearsal space. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we were all there and we were setting up. And then, you know, David walked in and, and, um, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable in a way, now looking back on it, because he was, um, you know, from, the, from that day and every day after that, that I ever was with him, 
when he walked in the room, there was just this real presence about him. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it was just that he was, he was really present in the moment, and you just felt him taking everything in. Um, it wasn't like he was sitting there on his cell phone, you know, or he was, right. you know, disconnected. He was completely connected with the environment in front of him and completely engaged. And that was something that I really came to um, admire and appreciate about being with him, you know, was just that presence. Um, anyway, so he was there and, uh, you know, eventually um, he came over to me. <laughs> we started, you know, small talking a bit and... And, you know, as the day went on, he eventually asked me for my, uh, my email address, mm. my phone number, which I gave him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, good idea. And, uh, and he emailed me. He emailed me the next day, I think it was, and, and um, sent over a song. And basically uh, was saying, you know, he'd love to record the song with my group and, and you know, maybe two or three songs and... Mm -hmm. You know, and he said it, you know, that was another thing about him is he just, his command of language was really, really deep. I mean, he just said it in the, the funniest way, you know, it'd be, you know, something like, you know, it would, it would just be a dream for me to record two or three songs with you and your group. Okay, that's, yeah. you know, you looking at, I'm sitting at home in Brooklyn, you know, one of my kids is like, you know, needs a diaper change and I'm just looking at that email like, wow. Yeah, screen capture that. Yeah, print yeah. Print it out, frame it on Exactly, <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, uh, really exciting. Um, and then there was another, wor another workshop session for, with Sue maybe a couple weeks after that. And then we recorded it about a month after that. And at this point, um, you know, he had sent me some more music. And so that was kind of rolling. And, and in terms of Sue, um, just, a, just a kind of a, a, an interesting story I thought was you know, we spent five or six hours recording this, and it's like a large ensemble. Maria's conducting, and David and Tony are just in the control booth the whole time. You know, again, he's just taking everything in, and, and you know, it's like a nine-minute piece. So it's, finally we get it together, we splice it together, and then um, I was going to improvise over the whole piece. Um, but before doing that, um, David was going to put down what they call a scratch vocal, which is basically just having the vocal there so that we know, the improvisers know where it is and we can play around it, so on and so forth. So he comes out, you know, six hours in the control booth. He comes out, they put him in a little room, like, <clears throat> you know, it clears his voice, maybe like 30 seconds of singing into the microphone to get his level, and they roll the tape. Well, they press record now because it's digital. But anyway, they record, and he sings, Sue, start to finish, you know, and... And it's, and um, I think he, they might have, you know, oh, let me just, yeah, I think he might have punched one or two things really briefly. And then it was like my turn. <laughs> and I went, you know, played. And then I played just thinking, oh, they're probably going to, you know, a little blip here, a little note there, you know. But I, I went ahead and just played over the whole thing a few times. Ryan Keverly did the same on trombone. We did a little bit together. And that was it. I went off to a gig. So a couple months later, I hear the song and it's you know his it's i'm sure it's his vocal from the scratch thing in fact it was confirmed but like i couldn't believe it that he was able to just you know Get it and, done. and that, if you're familiar with that song or if you have a chance to listen to it it's a kind of a tour de force mm -hmm. vocally you know he's really kind of going all out and and uh so I thought that was pretty remarkable. And, and then, you know, like the, the saxophone solo from start to finish, I was like, whoa, you know, I just Everything made it, it in. Yeah. yeah, everything made it in. And then, um, but that was, you know, something that I came to when it came time to start working. Well, when the Black Star started, that dynamic repeated itself, you know, where, I mean, he was singing with us. And then, you know, we'd, we'd get the track, we'd get the take, and... Um, Maybe we'd fix a bass and drum thing if it needed to, and then he would go out, maybe fix a vocal thing or add some harmonies, but it all happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. you know. And then we also um, really had uh, a green light to, to just go for whatever we were hearing, add whatever we were hearing. Yeah. Um, I was curious to talk about that too. Oh yeah, in, go ahead, go the, ahead. In the creative process, because I have I've had the pleasure to speak with a few other people who, who worked with uh, David Bowie, and I've heard two distinct things that that sort of 
you know, channel themselves. One being that when he has an idea, it's very clear to him exactly what he's looking for. But then what almost seems counter to that is that he's very good at giving long leash to the people that he works with. Mm -hmm. So I was curious when you were in the studio working with him, how much, how much play did you have uh, versus you know, how clear his ideas were on what he was trying to create? Well, I would say that the clarity was um, in the demos that he sent me. Mm. Um, when, and, and I wasn't sure as I had them, I, when I had them and I was listening to him, I wasn't sure like, well, what's gonna happen? Are we opening this up for solos? Mm -hmm. Are we gonna you know, modulate? Are we gonna experiment with form? Like, I, had, I, had, I just didn't really know. So I just tried to prepare for everything. And one thing that I did um, was I know that I knew that he was a, a fan of Stan Kenton when he was growing up, and that he really loved Gil Evans' music, and obviously was a fan of Maria. So I thought, you know, and I was also kind of starting to hear um, some different things with the horn lines, you know, like um, some counterpoint, some or you know, I. I uh, basically started to orchestrate the stuff for all the different instruments I play, which is, you know, alto flute, flute, clarinet, soprano, tenor, but just sort of making this kind of um, horn section mm -hmm. feeling, especially with the alto flute, it really gives it kind of a brassy sound. It makes everything feel bigger, like there's actually a brass section in there. So, um, so I started doing that because I was hearing it and um, I kind of wanted to surprise him. <laughs> with it, you know, and see what he, and see what he thought. And so when we started recording, at, you know, the first tune, I was like, oh, and I added some lines here, and then I was like, hey, I got, and, and he was totally cool with it. Yeah. I mean, totally. Um, and um, so I felt like there was just, you know, I could go for anything. But that being said, that clarity you were talking about in your question, the songs provided a lot of that. Mm. So it wasn't like, anything major, you know, oh, we don't need to, you know, sw you know, we essentially, I guess what I'm trying to say is essentially the song forms that you hear on Black Star are what he sent in the demo. And it's just us realizing that. And it's a more, you know, there's more horn parts, there's more keyboard things happening. Mm -hmm. But um, he said, you know, um, various times through the process, you know, go for whatever you're hearing. And Jason Lindner, who played keyboards, um, you know, he, he had nine keyboards in the studio. So, you know, we were experimenting with different sounds and he was adding, I mean, I guess one thing is, is I remember at the end of one day on the song Black Star, David had left and, you know, we were just kind of wrapping up and Jason's like, oh, I got this, can I just put one thing on? Tony was like, yeah, of course. And he goes out there and he just doubled the bass drum on, on the song Black Star. Do-do, 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 do-do. Do something like that. I can't remember the exact rhythm, but and and as that was the first song, I think that was the first song that came out. Mm -hmm. as Black Star. Yeah, it was. Um, that's you hear that right away. You hear the bass drum and synth doubling that. It's like a big part for me of the song. Mm -hmm. And it was just this like you know end of the day. Oh, I've got one more idea, and and then, and I think all of us, uh, Tim Lefebvre, Ben Monder, Mark, you know, as we listen to that record, it's like wow, they left everything in there that we played. No, I mean, and I think that's one thing that for us felt so wonderful about hearing it was like, we listened to it, it's like, that, that's us. Right. That's what we do. We hear the interaction, all this, like, it's all there. And that, I guess that's, you know, that was really affirming because that's what he wanted. He wanted us to do our thing and they left it in there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like this, you know, okay, let's just add like 20 synths and a string section and, I mean, Tony and David did add things, but it's so well done, and it's so, that's I think one of the great things about the record, when, I, when listening back to it, there's so many layers of content in there, and the way it works together, the way it's mixed together, is really uh, tremendous. Yeah. So how did, when, when you guys were making Black Star in the studio, was No Plan a part of that? Were, were these songs that were, recorded at the same time, produced at the same time, that just didn't make the record? Or was this something that came along after the fact and say, hey, we have some extra material, maybe we should realize this as well? No, it was all part of the Black Star Sessions. Mm. Yeah, in fact, No Plan is the song. So there was very much a plan. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it was. It wasn't called No Plan at the time. I don't think it was Wistful. I think was was the working title. But um, that was one song that we recorded probably seven times, which was by far the most takes that we ever did of anything. And it was because we we were we were uh, experimenting with different orchestration, you know, acoustic bass, electric bass, um, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, the, so th that No Plan and those other songs that came out, um, I'm forgetting the titles, but they were all part of the Black Star Sessions. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So from that experience, obviously what transpired, transpired, but you've moved on with, with the band that you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, to record your most recent release, which is Beyond Now. Yes. Uh, talk about how that process rolled out and the, the influence of, of working with Bowie, going through everything that, that you went through and then maintaining those relationships with the band to work on your new record. Yeah, um, it was, I think the last day I worked on, the last group period that we worked on Black Star was in March. Um, and then I did a day of woodwind overdubs in April. So then a couple months later in the summer, I had some time to write music, and you know, as you can imagine, I'd been his music was just had been just in my head for months, you know, and so it was still it was still there, and um, I'd been listening a lot to um, Dead Mouse and um, Kendrick Lamar mm -hmm. and Aphex Twin as well, and I think the, you know those were all kind of there as I sat down and. So in terms of the original music on Beyond Now, it was all written that summer. And um, those are the main influences. Um, one of the, the, the song Beyond Now, the title track, I was, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of writing the song and I was just thinking, man, this is um, familiar. Like what, what and, and I realized that it was, it was similar to an intro of one of David's tunes that didn't make Black Star, but um, came out later. Um, but there was just sort of these three elements, like a bass line and a kind of inner voice that was moving almost chromatically and then a melody that was kind of floating on the top. Um, and there's, so there's other moments like that where I could feel the direct influence of, of his music. I mean, with some of his music, there's a real like urgency at the beginning of the song. And um, I, that was something that I was thinking about when I was writing this music. But then also, you know, these other, other influences that I mentioned were also really present. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it was writing the original music and then with the guys developing it as we would play and working on the form and, you know, um, sort of fine tuning, uh, fine tuning over the fall when we were touring. And then the other thing was like, what, what um, other songs should I add to this? And, you know, cover songs. And David Binney, um, who's produced most of my records, you know, we had a lot of back and forth about different options. And, um, you know, one song I knew I wanted to do was Warsawa hmm. because uh, we had started playing it a couple uh, weeks after David passed because we were doing this uh, week at the Village Vanguard in New York City, which was my first time there as a band leader. So it was a big deal because that's like the jazz mecca, right. you know. Uh, so so it was a big deal to me. And then, you know, him passing, it was just, you know, really uh, devastating. Um, and then I was just thinking about, well, how do I, you know, pay tribute to him. I don't feel like I can play anything from Black Star. It's too much. But um, eventually, you know, we settled on that tune. Jason recommended it, started playing it, and, and it just was um, really cathartic to be able to play it every night of every set mm -hmm. on that gig and just kind of help to channel, you know, everything that had happened into sort of a musical context. So, and it's a great song. Yeah. So, so I was like, okay, we definitely need to record this. and. Um, and there's a, there's a handful of covers on the record, yeah. uh, some really diverse covers, really diverse source material. Yeah. And in listening to it, it's a, an interesting blend of elements of electronic music mm. uh, mixed with ma obviously modern jazz and, and improvisation. And I know that a, a couple of your Grammy nominations are for improvisational solos. Yeah. How did you approach merging electronic music, which is traditionally very structured and repetitive, mm. with what is more like your wheelhouse of improvisation and freedom and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I think it's, um, as a saxophone player, part of what's interesting is how can I improvise within this sonic context, sonic rhythmic context, in a way that feels authentic to me. Mm -hmm. 
And it eliminates some of the bebop vocabulary to be, you know, that I've grown up with or that was part of my thing. And, but so it, it, it's, a, it's been, you know, a kind of an opportunity for me to find new language that feels right for this context. So um, part of it has been exploring the instrument, you know, finding multiphonics and overtones and um, these different ways of creating sound that feel like, oh yeah, that feels like square pusher. Mm -hmm. Or that's like something that Aphex Twin would do or Venetian snares, and now I'm in there with these guys. And Tim uses a lot of pedals, the bass player, and Jason with synths, and there's a lot of pedals. So those guys, part, I guess part of the aesthetic of the band is, aesthetic of the band is improvising with sound mm -hmm. and not always notes. So for me as an acoustic instrument, um, it was like, how can I, how can I um, explore this territory? So it's been, it's been fun to be like, okay, I gotta find some new, a new vocabulary to drop from. So that's been part of it for me. Um, now I'm actually using electronics um, as of about two months ago, I started, started doing things. But, but prior to that, it was just finding different, different ways of playing and just think, you know, thinking about um, more of a percussive rhythmic language in my playing not always feeling like it's gotta be super melodic or whatever, and just trying to you know, experiment with all that stuff. Um, that's been part of it. And then also, as I mentioned before, the idea of improvising with sound mm -hmm. and rhythm that the, that the guys in the rhythm section, they do that a lot, and just finding my way in there with them. Um, so it's been, it's been really fun. I mean, one way I describe it is that um, what we do, you know, it, like, like people would say, you know, how do you describe your music? Or, you know, or they would, with, in terms of David, it would be like, oh, David Bowie does a jazz record. Well, that's not true. Blackstar's not a jazz record, you know? And, and what do I, you know, what do I do? I would say right now, you know, we're exploring the intersection of electronic and music and improvisation. And that, to me, that's like, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's to me more of what it is. You know, it's kind of a hybrid group where, you know, the drums are still acoustic. And uh, until two months ago, I was acoustic. Now I'm, mm -hmm. I'm electrified. But um, <laughs> it's, it's really fun because it feels like it's something really different. And all of us in the group grew up not just being jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I t talking about my upbringing. And then, you know, I've continued to just be um, in involved in a lot of different kinds of music. And so all of that comes into play in this situation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's why we're able to sort of negotiate these different styles in a, yeah. in a cohesive way. It was really interesting. My first experience with the record uh, it comes on, and I'm sort of like, oh, this, this reminds me of like a Herbie Hancock uh, when he first broke into the synth and electronic world, mm -hmm. but not really. And then I'm listening a little bit more. I'm like, oh, I can totally hear like the Dead Mouse influence. Yeah, but not really. Like none of that stuff really explains the full compass of what you've created in the album. I really enjoyed it. By Thank, the you. Thank you. Uh, so we do want to open it up to audience question and answer. If you guys have some questions, please make your way to the microphone. While, while people are sorting themselves out to do that, I did want to ask you, though, about what's next. What, uh, are you, you plan on hitting the road again to support the record? Are you doing yes. some stuff here in the city? Mm. Basically, I'm, um, I've got a couple more weeks off, and then I'm going to go to Australia and Japan and the West Coast and then across Canada, and then to Europe. And it's all... Um, it sounds like a very linear trip. Yes, yeah, linear trip. <laughs> but it's all presenting Beyond Now live. But I do have um, some new material that I'm developing, what, that we're playing now. And I'm hoping to, um, in these next couple weeks, write some more music. And part of what I'm hearing is working with vocals. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm not um, sure exactly. It's not going to be me, by the way. <laughs> but I'm kind of working on, you know, what's that going to look like? Who's that going to be? You know, so that's 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 where it's headed. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Let's take a question from the audience. Uh, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the question I would have is be how fleshed out were the demos that David Bowie gave you? Because he the B side of Sue was uh, "Tis a Pity She Was a Whore," and that seemed like it was just him and a keyboard. How orchestrated and how involved were the demos that you were initially given? Let's see. I would say fairly, you know, fairly developed because because there was always a uh, like a drum, you know, a drum loop 
that was one bar, maybe two bars long, synth bass, and then um, David singing, and um, guitar on most things, maybe not everything, and then you know some other synth, like sometimes the horn lines would be on synth. Um, so it was, it was that, that's kind of the basic orchestration of what the demos were. I'm trying to think if there's any exceptions to that. Um, think for a second. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. So, so again, it was for, for us, it was, the information was all there. It was just, it was just kind of up to us to, um, to realize it and, and to, you know, I was talking earlier about sort of what I, the, the approach that I took in terms of orchestrating things and adding harmony to the, to the horn, uh, the horn stuff, but, um, but it was all there. And uh, yeah, the only tune that we really experimented with a lot in terms of form was um, the version that we did of Sue. Because I think initially it was like, how do you, how do you, you can't really, you know, the version with Maria, with the orchestra, there's so much content there. So I, I, I actually, I thought, well, why don't we just go the other direction where it's like David, drums, and bass, you know, and have it be just like super intense and the guys going nuts and him just on top of that. And um, initially I was cueing, you know, the different sections or whatever, but <laughs> it didn't, just the flow really wasn't there. So we really kind of went back to the song form from the Maria version, but just, you know, pared down. And um, I did kind of a reduction of the orchestration stuff just for uh, clarinet and flutes. And, um, and, and, and just, it just ended up working out. Like we played a certain amount of the song and then at the end we're just kind of jamming. And there's, that's, for me, on, there's one part of that it's near the end of the song where he kind of modulates to another key when he's singing. So, and he kind of goes, I think it's up a half step or something, and you hear the whole rhythm section just kind of bend with him. <laughs> it's like really, it's like a, like a, you know, jazz moment. Like he's improvising. You know, he's just taking the melody and just, you know, going for something, and everybody, and it was like, it was such a beautiful moment to me. Mm. And I was like, he's such a bad dude, because he's, you know, willing to go for that in the moment. And then, then they left it in there, you know? And it sounds, it's just um, tremendous. So. I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> sure. I think we have another. Yeah, I'm just curious about your recent experiments with electronics. Uh, woodwinds as a class of instruments uh, uh, seem to be maybe among the most difficult to interface with electronics. And uh, electronic wind instruments uh, is almost a different instrument. And I know woodwinds players do play that. Yes. Uh, but I'm just curious about your experiments and, you know, to the extent that you're willing to yeah. divulge. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, I, I guess I, I felt, you know, with the iwi, um, I just never really heard it, you know, for myself. I loved hearing people play it, but part of the thing for me with the electronics was like, I don't want to sound just like a synth because I already have somebody doing that. Mm -hmm. Like, I still want the sound of the saxophone there. So just for the longest time, I just wasn't, feeling like there was a way to do it that made sense. And then everybody was telling me how difficult it is to capture the signal on the saxophone and so on and so forth. So basically, eventually, I was, uh, but I just love the sound of the ring modulator. <laughs> I love it, man. And Tim Lefebvre has used it for years. And I just kept thinking, man, if there was a way I could do that. And then I was on a gig with Maria a few months ago, and um, Mike Rodriguez was playing trumpet. And he had a clip-on mic, and then he had, um, uh, his output was going into a, a, a preamp, like a little preamp you know, on stage. And then he had some delay thing on. So I was like, that's cool. That's something I could do, and I don't have to take like um, a rack of extra baggage or what, like it's a few boxes, fits in. in the Building it like a guitar player's pedal board. So I got the preamp, and because I, I felt like the most important thing was like, how do I really capture the saxophone sound first? And then I want to manipulate it. So that, the, the preamp solved that, this little preamp. And then I went, to, I was in Chicago, um, and a buddy of mine works at um, Reverb. Jim Turk works at Reverb.com. Mm -hmm. So I emailed him, hey, I'm interested in ring modulators. And I was looking online, and there's, 
I talked to my friends, like the Mooger Fooger that people mm-hmm. love, and, and uh, there's a couple others. Um, and it's, you, know, you look at the online demo, and it's almost always guitar. There was one for saxophone. Um, so I went, and Jim had like three different pedals, and I just A beat him. And the one that really worked best for saxophone was the Fairfield ring modulator. So that was the first thing I got. And then um, he just threw in a couple other like delay reverb things. And one, the one I got was the, oh, it's from Akron, Ohio. Is this uh, an Earthquaker? Earthquaker. That's it. So that's, that's all I have right now. I just have the preamp, the ring mod, and the Earthquaker. But that in and of itself has opened up a big world for me. And, you know, I haven't even really even practiced with it. I've just, just um, maybe once before soundcheck, about a half hour, I was just messing with it. But I've been hearing it for a while. And the thing that I love is that the way the setup is so far, it, 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 I can go between a clean sound and that sound, and it feels really seamless. And then the, 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 the um, distorted ring modulator sound doesn't sound like a synth to me. Mm-hmm. It just sounds like a really edgy saxophone, like distorted, and really, it adds a lot of the New York angst that I feel. Nice. So, uh, nice. no, but so, so I love it, you know, and then you can, and, and, then, the, and then the reverb and d- delay, you know, so it's, it's, it's been great so far, and, and I've just been like improvising with it on gigs, and it's felt great. Um, so I'm open to new stuff, and, and I just need kind of time mm-hmm. to explore it, but I'm loving it. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so the album is called Beyond Now. It is available now. Yes. Uh, where, how do people connect with you? What's the best way to find out? Where are you going to be? How can we come see a show? Well, my website, DonnieMcCaslin.com, you know, has a tour page, and then I have a Facebook um, you know, band page. Uh, that information is posted on, on Twitter, you know, Donnie McCaslin, so sort of all that stuff. But I guess my website's probably the main thing. Uh, and the record is on Motema Records, and folks can get that at iTunes and, and you know, Amazon. Google and, Play. And, yeah, Google, there you go. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's out there, and, and I'm sure having a lot of fun presenting it. All right, well, we thank you very much for taking thank the time. Thank you, Matt. My pleasure. Thanks for having Donnie McCaslin. Thank you.